Moza Nation, I wanted to give you an inside look at one of our internal company trainings where we talked about personal finance. And so I was asked by a lot of people on my, in my company uh, to do a training on this for them internally. Um, and we got a lot of good feedback from it. And so I thought I would share it with you guys. I got the sign off from my team. Um, and this is going to basically explain to you how you can be in the top 1% without having extraordinary means of income. And if you do have extraordinary income, then you should definitely be there without making stupid decisions, all right? And so uh, in the video, I'm gonna be covering uh, different different things for savings, different things for investing, different ways to structure things, um, and all that kind of awesome stuff. So uh, if you guys don't know who I am, my name is Alex Ramosi. We own acquisition.com. It's an $85 million per year portfolio. There's a lot of broke people out there and I don't want you to be one of them. Welcome to Mosey Nation. I'll see you guys in the vid. Quick word from our sponsors before we get going. There's this lovely book. This is the, this is the, the, the actual manuscript of uh, $100 million offers. Uh, thanks to most of you guys on this call, it's the number one new release in advertising. So thank you. Um, <laughs> when you get to the about halfway point of the book, there's one page that reminds you to uh, leave a review. And if you could do that, it would be very helpful because uh, the more people read the book, the more businesses find out about us, the more businesses find out about us, the more sales we make, the more sales we make, the more secure everyone is and the more jobs we can, we can have and the more clients we can help through our uh, our businesses by extension and so the more we can change the world so um your book review may indeed change the world uh and so uh that is how meaningful it is so please um go ahead and uh and and, and grab the book it is 99 cents um if uh if if it's too steep for you um then don't get the book so uh <laughs> without further ado uh today what i want to talk about is personal finance um and rather than do a slide presentation um sometimes I want to mix mix it up. Um, I have a, a bunch of bullets, uh, and I think it went really well with the gym work. So I wanted to kind of do the same thing. And uh, Layla and I talked about who's going to talk about what, uh, because we both are involved in our finances. Uh, that's not always the way, you know. In a lot of marriages, you know, one person manages the money, one person does other things. But as a, as as resident cheapskate um, of our marriage, it uh, it made sense to have uh, personal finance fall to me. And so uh, I will kick this off, kick this puppy off with some stats and a quote. So, quote number one, the first $100,000 is a bitch, but you gotta do it. I don't care what you have to do, if it means walking everywhere, not eating anything that wasn't purchased with a coupon, find a way to get your hands on $100,000. After that, you can ease off the gas a little. Charlie Munger, Vice Chairman, Berkshire Hathaway. Some of you guys may know this, but uh, Charlie Munger is my probably my number one resource for all things wisdom and money. And uh, I actually think he might even be a better teacher than Warren Buffett. I think Warren Buffett just picked a couple of stocks that ended up outperforming Charlie's. And Charlie has not had any like massive home runs. He's just been a consistent investor for a long period of time um, and a, a general salt of the earth individual who is full of wisdom. And so if you are looking for wisdom when it comes to money, uh, I, would, I would recommend anything that is written by him or any talks that he gives. What I want to transition to is um, the reason behind this, this kind of you know, leadership meeting. A lot of times we talk about management and uh you know leadership in general and character traits and things like that my goal in general as my life has progressed is to make as many people wealthy and independent as humanly possible and so each of the businesses that we've had have have done that and there's different people who become you know uh wealthy you know through gym lords it's obviously our our clients but i think as as i've gotten older my care has actually shifted towards uh you guys uh, our employees of the company and making sure that everyone here um becomes independently wealthy and so what I want to do is lay out a plan that literally everyone in this call can become independently wealthy if you follow it. Is that cool with everyone? Is that all right? Let's do it. Can I have right. thing, Alex? Yes, absolutely. It's like as a belief breaker, which is just like everyone in any position in a company, right? Everyone has different compensation levels that they're compensated at. I think something that um, is really interesting is that what I've noticed over the years is that it's often not correlated with how much money you make, but it's correlated with everything Alex is going to talk about, which is how much money you don't spend. <laughs> and so I've had personal conversations with a lot of you who, you know, maybe you're in the middle tier in terms of compensation, yet you have more saved and more in your bank account and less debt than those who make more money in the company. And so I just want to put that out there is that it's often, you know, getting rid of the downside rather than increasing the upside. Another quote for you. You cannot outwork money. And so ideally, you would like money working for you. A horrifying stat is that the average American has a negative net worth. Literally, if they were born, if you're born a baby and you have zero net worth, you're already in the top, you're already above average because you're at zero. Think about how fucking wild that is. That's insane. 
And that is because people make poor choices, not because of anything else. And so I want to be very clear um, about my, my view on this. And it's one of victor rather than victimhood. We all make choices and independent of what we make, wealth is a ratio of what we spend versus what we earn. Therefore, if you earn anything, you can become wealthy by controlling what you spend. So that's stat number one. Stat number two, the average US minimum wage worker will accrue over a million dollars in earnings over their career if they lived and worked a minimum wage the entire time and never got a pay raise, which barely even makes sense because with, with every, you know, every four years, minimum wage goes up anyways, right? So think about that for a moment. That means a million dollars is going to flow through the hands of basically any worker who works full-time throughout their career in the US, all right? Next one, the median US income earner make over $3 million, they will earn that over their lifespan. Pretty wild, right? What if we controlled the flow and we actually made good decisions about that? Lots of cool things. And I will show you that in a moment. And I want to reiterate one more point. And if you want to dot it, underline it, highlight it, wealth is a ratio, not a number, between what you earn and what you spend. Right now, there is something that is in your life. If you do not have the amount of money you wish, or you're not saving, or investing at the amount that you want that is eating away at it. It is your number one nemesis. For some people, it's sneakers. For some people, it's eating out. For other people, it's clothing. And so the question that I have for you guys is first off, in the chat, if you guys will be open and honest with me, what is your vice? What is the thing that eats into your accounts? What is that thing that you love spending on and you feel guilty, but you get that dopamine rush every time you buy it? What is that? Please put it in the chat. The more honest we can be, the better it'll be for everyone. High heels. Me too. I'm with you on that one, Ryan. Skincare, eating out, kid stuff, food, food and beer. Okay, cool. Fantastic. This is good. Nicotine and coffee. I gotta be spending a lot of money on nicotine and coffee. <laughs> Alcohol, a lot of people. Drinking, going to the bars, going to the club, right? There's a lot of things. And so the next question is, um, and this is kind of why this is a behavioral question, because Becoming independently wealthy is not complex. It's simple, not easy. And so my question for everyone on this call is, are you willing to give up your vice to be a millionaire? It's a genuine question. I'll tell you a brief story um, and then I'll get into some of the more tactical stuff. And I wanna make uh, an example because there are some limiting beliefs around this that I think um, need to be debunked. Wealth is accrued through character traits. When I, uh, a lot of you guys may have heard of the story of when I was sleeping on my gym floor. Has anyone heard that story? Like I was sleeping on the floor, didn't have enough money, right? What you don't know is that I was making $5,000 my second month in business in profit. The, the third month, I made $10,000. The fourth month, I made, third month, I made $15,000. The next, I made 20. The next, I made 25. The next, I made 30. The next, I made 35. And that was in profit. And I was sleeping on the floor. And that was because for me, I get tremendous amount of, of anxiety if I spend any amount of the income that I earn that is not negligible. And so I wanted to take as much of that money that was coming in and adding it to my bank account. And so for me and for everyone here, if you can gamify that one simple number, which is what is in your bank account, you will win the game. And so many of you are not in complete control of your finances because you also have a spouse. And so we will, we'll distribute this to you guys. So if you want to play this with your spouse, because maybe by the end of this call, you decide to make some decisions, I'd like to get them bought in as well, because you have to do it together, right? Not one of you can do this. You both have to do this together if you are married. But if you do commit to this and you can play a game, which is the game is how little can we spend and see if you can beat your last month's total every month, see what else you can trim, see what else you can not spend money on because it becomes fun and interesting. And as soon as you can make not spending money fun, I promise you, you will have more money than you ever need. You'll be able to eliminate the stress in your life around money. And I mean this so sincerely from the bottom of my heart. Everyone here in this company can become independently wealthy, can become the top 1% in America, simply by the habits that you choose to make today. Like I, I can't, I'm serious as cancer right now. And I, I wish I could tell better stories that I knew how to believe, break the blues and we can do this. Um, and I'll try and address them at the end because some of you will have limiting beliefs around this. But if you make the steps that I'll walk through today, um, they, will, they will benefit you. And there's only six steps that I'll walk through. They're very simple and they're very straightforward, okay? Now, next, next little stop in our adventure, okay, is let me show you 
the eighth wonder of the world. Does anyone know what the eighth wonder of the world is? So let's say, Marcos, how old are you? You can unmute if you want to just tell me. He's, He's at 19. 19 on the chat. Fantastic. Want to see some crazy shit, Marcos? Because I'm about to show you. Let's say you have $0 saved up. Okay? I don't know what you got saved up, but let's say you've got $0 saved up. Are you curious by any chance how much, if you saved $100 a month, you would have by the end? This is not the actual amount. Are you curious? Do you want to know how much you'd have if you saved up $100 a month and you just put it in the S&P between now and when you're 75? Yes. You're curious? Do you want to see? Very. $2.7 million. Pretty fucking interesting, right? Yes. Very. <laughs> I would agree <laughs> with you. So check this out. Let's make this zero. This is something that I have saved on my phone. This calculator, I have saved on my phone. And so right now, let's say that you're looking at making uh, a Jordan's purchase, right? You see the new Jordans and you're like, man, them shits are sexy. So you take your hundred dollars and you think, well, I could either have these Jordans or when I retire, I could have $22,000. Which would you prefer? The 22 grand. I, I agree with you. I would as well. I made similar decisions throughout my life. Now, if you looked at going out to dinner, for example, or going out to lunch, and maybe just going out to lunch three days a week, right? It's an extra, let's say 12 bucks a day, right? Three times a week. So it's 36 bucks times four. So you're looking at like 130, 140 bucks, just by not eating out. $31,000. Damn. And that's just one month. Now, if you did that for a year, you'd have $400,000. Wow. I agree with you, but no one does the fucking math. That's crazy. I've never thought about it that way. That is the purpose of this call. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Marcos. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you bet. And so one of the number one things that happens and one of the limiting beliefs that people have is that the amount that I can save right now is not enough. It's not enough to make a dent. It's not enough to do damage. Now, some of you on this call might not be 19 years old and have you know, 60 years of compound behind you, right? So let's look at, let's look at what probably the median age in this company is, which is 35 years old, okay? And so let's be a little bit more uh, aggressive here. Let's say again, you start at zero, but you decide to start saving $500 a month. I know, that's aggressive, but let's just say if you did, you'd be able to retire with $3 million. It's 100 bucks a week. The thing is, is that just about everyone here, if you make different choices about how you live, what you spend your money on, you would be able to have this outcome. And I mean this genuinely from like the bottom of my heart. It's just like fitness, right? You have to, you have to burn more than you, than you eat. This is simple. Eat less than you burn. Or yes, exactly. Thank you. Saving money in personal finance are simple, except the thing with weight loss is you don't have any compounding thing that's working for you, right? With money, your money works for you, right? While you sleep. And so that's the magic of this. And here's what's cool, Marcos. I will show you something interesting. Now you may be like, how is that even possible? How can I save $500 a month from now being 35 until I'm 75. Well, you only contributed $240,000 here. I mean, that's a lot, but this is how much your money worked for you, which is why you can't outwork money. You have to let money work for you. And so the number one thing that will create wealth for everybody here is your income. That is the thing that will create that. That is the flow, right? Now, obviously throughout the company, you can look at different opportunities to make more money, to, to, you know, to get promoted, to, to add more value to the company and things like that. So you can increase your inflow. But for just about everyone here, and what's kind of funny is that I have had many conversations with people and I, I want to be really transparent here. There are people who make the most in this company are among the most, I would say the top 10% earners in this company who I've had conversations with, who have $0 saved up. I've also had conversations with people who are the top 10% earners in the company who have negative net worth. I've also had conversations with people who are in the bottom 20% in this company and have higher net worth than the people in the top percent, 10%. And so to me, that shows that it's choice. It's just a choice. And what I can tell you as somebody who's made this phenomenal amount of money throughout my life, my level of well-being has been no way affected by anything that I've spent money on. Material goods do not increase my perception of subjective well-being. And so if, you're, if your goal is to seek to decrease the anxiety that you have in your life because of finances, then the easiest way to do that is to spend less money because you have lower risk. Consider your fixed expenses and your lifestyle, your risk basis. This is your risk that you have as an individual. And so if you can make yourself an investment that has very low risk and very high return, you will reap the benefits over a long period of time. And so 
This again is assuming you save $500 a month. That's it. Now let's just get wild. And let's say you go all in on this. and You, you, just, you just go nuts. And I'm gonna give you some of the habits and all that kind of stuff in a second, but I just wanna paint the picture first. So let's say you did the same exact thing, but you were like, you know what? I'm totally changing my lifestyle. I'm downgrading where I live. I'm selling the lease on my car and I'm buying a car in $5,000 in cash that I have no payments. Let's see where this takes us. 2,500 bucks a month, it's $14 million. Just if, in case you're curious, that's not the top 1%. That's the, that's the top 0.4% of the United States. And you just get there through making smart choices. And this again is assuming you have $0 saved up. So this is for you, Marcos. Let's say you save $25,000 by the end of this year because you do a great job and you live like a cheap ass, all right? And you put no more money in for the rest of your life, all right? And you start because you're 19 years old. That's how much money you can have, $5.5 million. If you just save $25,000 today and put it in the S&P and never think about it again. Marcos, you could be hood rich, right? <laughs> and so one of the things, does anyone here know what the number one drain on net worth is besides taxes? 35% of every single American's paycheck goes to this one thing. Yes, Laura LaRose. Interest, 35%. So for context, imagine, right? Imagine where you had a franchise, right? And so I, I own, I'm the franchise of Subway. I have, I license out my business model to 10,000 restaurants. Subway gets 10% and they kill their franchisees because there's no margin in food. Do you know who's killing them three and a half times more? The banks. 35% of the average American paycheck goes to interest. That's it. And so right now, what I just showed you was $500 a month. So can everybody here, just for, just for shits and giggles, multiply what you take home by 0.35. Put that in that calculator. I'll wait for you guys to do it. Multiply what you make by 0.35 and put that in as your monthly contribution. You can start with $0. You put 75 as your retirement age. And the reason you do that is because we're all gonna live a lot longer than our ancestors did. So while you guys are doing that and getting that calculation, and the reason I'm asking you to do this is because I want, you, I want to show you that it's worth it to make these decisions. And so the reason 35% is that, for example, let's say you buy a house, right? You've lived, you're, you're, you're realizing the American dream, which is hilarious because you didn't actually buy a house, you got a loan because the banks have, zillions of dollars of advertising to make you, to fool you into believing that, that is now the American dream is that you owe them money. That's the American dream is that you owe someone else money and that 35% of your paycheck goes to them for the rest of your fucking life. You could also get into student debt, which I, I abhor and hate to like every ounce of my being, but I won't even get into that. So let's just talk mortgages. If you do buy a house and you're the average American and you move in three years, which is what the average American does, they move every three years. Do you have any idea what percentage of all those quote mortgage payments that you're making are going towards principal, which means the actual amount of the house? Dominic, correct. If you have a 30 year mortgage, your first three years, you're paying jack shit towards your principal, which means you just leased it from the bank and then they get somebody else in and then they, and they, and 97% of the dollars that go in there go to them and the bank holds the note on everything. To the same degree, if you buy a car, and you can't buy it in cash, the same interest applies, except it's even higher. Isn't that wild? Isn't that nuts? What's, what's more is that for those of you who have uh, student loans, think of how crazy this is. They lobbied to get the government to back student loans, which means they gave 18 year olds. So everybody who's on the sales team understands this. But if we try and give a business owner, get a business owner financed, right, in real terms of the likelihood that they pay back the debt, for even $15,000, right? The approval rate's like one out of three for 15 grand. And yet because the government allows this, they allow banks to give a loan for $200,000 to an 18 year old with zero fucking earning potential. And they say that they can never get out of it, which means that that percentage of your paycheck, what they did, just like that subway, that royalty off the top, they're getting a royalty on your fucking life. 35% of everything you make forever. 
and they allow people who aren't even old enough to drink, put themselves in enough debt they can never get out of. Now, I believe in personal accountability. You should be responsible for your decisions, but I don't think you should be subsidized back by the government. The purpose of today is hopefully to shock you a little bit into how much many people on this call are being robbed by decisions and the invisible hand that is taking money from your pocket every single month. And so if you guys will let me, I would like to walk you through six steps to get out of this mess. Is that okay with you guys? So you saw the sunny side, which Marcos got to see. He can be worth $6 million if he just saves 25 grand this year and doesn't do anything else. On the flip side, for everyone else, right? Not just Marcos. Hopefully Marcos, you don't have a mortgage and student loans and all the other things, right? Hopefully. Um, for everyone else, you can see what has been robbing you and your ability to create generational wealth is this one thing. And so my goal is to get us to get this, this, this monkey off our backs. And so one more, one more stat that I will, that I'll, I'll push towards you is that does anyone here, anyone willing to be honest that is anyone here have credit card debt? Does anyone have credit card debt? Okay. So who here know, has heard, you know, like compounding is the eighth wonder of the world, which is what Marcos's eyes popped out of his head when he saw the number, right? Eighth wonder of the world is compounding. You can also have negative compounding interest, which compounds against you. And so you have the eighth wonder of the world beating you up every single day rather than lifting you up so that you can become financially free. That is the eighth wonder of the world working against you because it's compounding. And for many of you, you know, credit card debt, 10, 12, 16% per year. If you could get it, if you could get a, an investment that 16% a year, you'd be fucking stoked. And that's what exactly what every single bank did in the world is they make you the investment that they get 16% compounding in. We cool? Is everyone like, do I have everyone's complete attention? What I want to hit on are the, the, six, the six pieces here, all right? Number one is that you have to start saving money. And you do that before you start paying debt off, all right? And you're like, how much do I save? What you save is something called an emergency fund. And the reason you start there rather than paying off your debt is because something will come up. And if you learn the habit of stopping to pay off your debt, you'll stop paying it off. It's like going on vacation. And so think of this as the vacation fund for your financial fitness, is that we need to plan for the vacation that's going to come so that we don't get off base. For most people, that emergency fund is between $1,000 and $5,000. I will let you decide on, on what that is based on your income. But what that is, is when your carburetor and your car goes out, or when you break your foot and you have a service, it's the stuff that is, quote, unexpected, but 100% predictable that it's going to happen at some point in your life. And so the idea is plan for the thing that you know will happen. You just don't know when. The only variable is when, not if. And so has anyone here, I'll ask this question to prove the point. Can I just get hands? You can see it on the screen. Has anyone here in your life had an unexpected bill come up? So then can we call them unexpected? Let's call them expected bills and just plan ahead. All right. So the first thing that we do, so if you're writing this down, the first thing you do is you save between one and $5,000. I will let you make that decision. You are grownups. That means that even if you have your credit card debt, even if you have other things that are stupid, that's fine for right now. The first step is to save one to $5,000. Step one. Step two, you pay off all your debt minus your mortgage. So if you have a mortgage, don't worry about the mortgage for now. We'll get to that in a second. But except for the mortgage, you pay off all your debt. And it is my, my two cents that it's better to pay off the smallest debts you've got. Even if you've got one that's, let's say, 20% and you've got another one that's 10% and the 10% one is smaller, despite it mathematically making more sense to pay off the higher debt one, no one here has made any fucking rational decisions up to this point. So why would we make them now? The point is that we need to get the emotional victory. We need to lose some weight. We need to tighten our belt. All right. And you need the first win so that you can see that you can do this. And so you pay off the smallest debt first. And then you pay off the second smallest debt. And then you'll feel is momentum and you'll see that you can do it. And so what I, my earnest ask is that if you can team up with your spouse on this and you show them how much money you could be making with just what you're paying in debt right now, 35% of your paycheck and how it can be, create independent wealth for you and your family for the long run, just by doing this, then hopefully it will make it worth it more than getting a dessert at Chili's. Although I do love desserts at Chili's. I think they're fantastic. Do it when you can afford it and you can pay for it in cash and still hit your budget. To show you to the extent how much Layla and I believe in this, we bought our home in cash. We bought our cars in cash. Everything we pay for in cash. We have zero debt, total, zero. 
And what I can tell you is it feels good knowing that no one can take your shit away from you. Because for those of you who like to be more sophisticated and read up on articles on crypto and Robin Hood, let me tell you an interesting concept that I learned from somebody who's much wealthier than me. They said, debt increased risk. Risk, if expanded over a long enough time horizon, will eat away the returns that the additional leverage gave. Because anything, any number, no matter how big, multiplied by zero is still zero. So it doesn't matter how good you are and how much you saved, if you take on too much risk, which is what debt is, over a long enough time horizon, it will multiply you by zero. Which some of us are old enough, Marcos, you're not, but some of us are old enough to remember the 2008, 2009 collapse. I will tell you that just about every entrepreneur friend that I know lost everything. They had to start back at zero. And Marcos, you saw that you were at 19. And if you didn't fuck up, if you don't fuck up between now and when you're 75, which means you don't take on debt and you just continue to pay for things in cash and you budget how much you make, right? <laughs> and you spend less than what you earn, you'll be able to be financially wealthy for the rest of your life. You'll also never have to worry about money ever. And the only reason people don't do this is because they think that status and how good they feel about themselves live in the eyes of others rather than their own eyes. Would you rather be rich or have everyone think you're rich? It's a real question. And most people answer by their actions, which one they'd rather actually want, which is why finance and personal finance is much more a question of character than it is about intelligence. Is anything here complex that I've shown you? Arith arithmetically, save more than you earn, <laughs> right? Spend less than you earn. Do it for a long period of time. Don't buy shit you can't afford and borrow money to do it. I told you step one, save one to $5,000. Step two, pay off your debts smallest to largest, not in terms of interest, do it in terms of smallest to largest. For many of you, that may take one year, two years, or three years. And I know that this is the, that's the Rocky cutscene. That's the part of the movie that everyone fast forwards through. But I can tell you that the amount of spiritual growth that happens when you consistently live disciplined will change who you are and how much control you perceive that you have over your life. And you may lament the fact that you have student loans. You may lament the fact that you got into a 30-year mortgage. We'll talk about it in a second. But those things are done. There's nothing you can do about those. All we can do is the choices that we have in front of us. And so the question is, are we going to let the decision that we made years ago rob us of the future that we can have if we choose to have it? One, save one to five thousand dollars. Two, pay off all debt that is not, not your mortgage in terms of smallest to largest. You paid off. Just so you know, as soon as Layla and I started making money, we paid off her student debt, right? Like we live by this. This is, I believe this falls to bones through and through. All right. Third step in your, in your piece of, in your, in your financial freedom is actually expanding your emergency fund. Those savings. You don't invest those. Those are just so that you can live as a human being and feel safe. Some of you will have larger needs for security. Other of you will have smaller needs for security. And so the range for this is three to six months of living expenses. Now, the fact that you've done this after you paid off your debt aggressively, you will already have the character traits and the discipline to know how to live on less, which means you'll be very able to, one, you won't even have to save that much because you'll already have been living on so little. So three months might not even take you that long. And you would be amazed at how much more money you have when you have no debt that goes out every single month paying the banks. You will be blown away. So right now, for shits and giggles, because that's why we do this, right? Shits and giggles. Nothing here is serious as cancer, right? Except for, you know, your future and everything else. Shits and giggles. Who here has a car payment? Can you get a hand? You have a car payment? Okay. Who here leases where they live or has a mortgage? Now, if you were to add that amount of money up, remember that calculator? I want you to put that in the calculator again. I know. I'm asking you to do some work. I think it's worth it. Can someone throw some numbers of what that would equate to? $2.1 million. There it is. And just so you know, no one can guess what your car payment and your house payments are based on this number. So don't worry about it. $6 million, $3.2 million, $5.6 million, $3.8 million. So $2 million, $15 million, $1.5 million, $2.8 million. How fucking nuts is this? This is the shit they don't tell you. This is how everyone at the top makes all the money. They loan people who can't afford things, things they can't afford, and they saddle them with debt that's compounding against them for the rest of their lives. That's the secret. So if you don't want that working against you, these are the hard decisions. Right now, if you can have the hard, hard conversation with your spouse and think to yourself, 
Is there a way, because now at this point in, the, in, in, in this process, you can try and pay off where you live so that that money that you're currently outflowing becomes your retirement fund. You could literally do nothing else. You could just do that and, and own the car you have in cash. And just so you know, as somebody who's had supercars and had a Prius that was worth $5,000, it gets me from point A to point B in the exact same amount of time. It was also the biggest regret of my life is buying the, the, the Bentley that we have. Number one financial regret I have. I get zero enjoyment out of it. I miss our little broken Prius that had dents, a dent on the side door and had a crack through the windshield. And for context, just so you guys know that I'm drinking my own Kool-Aid, when we owned that car as the only car that Layla and I split, we were millionaires. And I had a lady who was in our mastermind named Monica Pitar, who saw us pull up to our mastermind in the Prius with a cracked windshield and the dent in the door. And she said, I thought you guys were supposed to be rich as she walked into the mastermind which you, as of course, a guru, are horrified by this, kind of, by this idea. And I said, I am. I said, you should look at my bank account. And so that's the kind of thing that just like, it just gives you, what kind of confidence do you want? Do you want someone to say nice car? Or do you want to be able to say, you should look at my bank account? There's a kind of stress-free living and there's a kind of confidence that comes from this. There's a kind of fuck you money energy that's hard to fake. And I would like that for everybody here on this call. And it is 100% attainable for everyone here. Just making the right choices. So, the number one, the easiest thing you can do is if you have a lease, you can turn it in early and you can buy a car for $5,000 in cash. You can save up for it. Okay. But once you do that, remember that $100 a month, that $200 a month that some of you guys are paying? As soon as you save up and you do that one time, that $200 a month becomes a constant flow that for the rest of your life is adding towards your net worth. And then you can choose to downgrade and not live in the really ritzy, fancy neighborhood that you live in now that might be above your means or rather is above your means because you can't buy the house in cash and you're just loaning it from the bank, right? And this is stuff that no one says it. Everybody wants to you know, impress their parents to show them what neighborhood they live in rather than impressing themselves and giving themselves a stress-free life. Again, for context, when I did decide to lease my first spot where I decided to live, if you guys are curious, I split a bedroom in a house, Six bedrooms. I split one bedroom with one, another guy. I paid $400 a month in rent and this is in Southern California. For anyone who has context, $400 a month in rent gets you nothing. <laughs> I split a bedroom in a house. And again, I was making $20,000 a month. And I'm not saying, I'm saying this because I believe in this so thoroughly. And very luckily on my part, I was, I was raised by a father who came to the United States with nothing. He was an immigrant. He had $1,000 that he was able to take with him. And so we'd split the paper towels in half, right? Because we didn't want to you know, waste them. We never use napkins because those are expenses. You use towels at the dinner table, right? You saved everything. We always would get like two milks at Costco, which were like the big ass gallon ones. And it was just me. I was the only kid. And he's like, drink up. It's going to go bad. Because he didn't want to buy the milk at Royal Farms or 7-Eleven, whatever you guys have. It was like a dollar more, all right? And that's why if you guys can gamify this with your spouse, you'll win the game. Because if you can play the game, you'll win. But most people just don't realize that you are in the game right now and other people are playing you. So I gave you the first habits, one to 5,000 of emergency. And you do that before you pay debt because something's going to come up and you don't want to break the cycle of paying off your debt. So you do that first. Then you start paying off your debts from smallest to biggest. All right, so you can get the emotional victories and you start winning. Number three, then you save up three to six months of living expenses so that you can feel financially secure. So you don't have to worry. This will lower your stress and it will make your life much better. The point that most people have of becoming wealthy is because they want to become happier. The easiest way to become happier is become less stressed. The easiest way to do that is save some fucking money. Fourth step. This is where you look at how you can start building wealth. All right. And so the way to do that, if you have a mortgage and you don't want to live somewhere else, renegotiate the mortgage. You can refinance right now because right now interest rates are nothing and try and get a 15 year fixed. That will make your mortgage go up, but the vast majority of the money will be going towards something that you own. And so your principal will start, you will be increasing your net worth. Fun fact. You don't pay capital gains on selling the house that you own. So if your primary home increases in value and you live in it for over two years and then you sell it and decide to go upgrade because it's gone up and you can buy 100% of your new house with the cash that you have saved up, you don't pay taxes. There are some things the government has done to help you out. That is one of them. So if you insist on, on living somewhere that is beyond what you can currently pay in cash, then refinance to get a 15 year fixed. And then when it comes to cars, if you can combine, because most of you guys work from home, well, most of you, everyone here works from home, <laughs> you probably only need one car. And if you're like, no way, it's like Layla and I live with one car. 
we still live with one car. Actually, shit, now we have two. But like we lived with one car for a very, very, very long time, right? And I'm about to return because I don't need to. So if you can buy a car in cash, which there are tons of good cars in cash, and here's what's crazy. Cars in cash that you buy and you use for three years, $5,000, you can sell for $5,000. You just use it for free. Pretty well. All right. Everyone ready for step five? Step five? All right. Step five is exciting. Step five is where you invest 15% of your pre-tax, pre-tax income into the S&P 500. Again, I'm not an investment professional. I do not recommend that you listen to me in any way. You should consult your own professional advisors for any investment advice. Uh, and this is not a recommendation at all because I don't know what I'm doing. And so you can make your own decisions as an adult uh, to choose to do with your money what you want to do. If you look at the last 80 years of the S&P 500, it's gone up by about 9 to 10% per year for that entire period of time. Now, if you guys haven't heard my talk on volatility and risk, it's good to understand this. The reason we built up the emergency fund of three to six months of living expenses is so that you never look at that money and that you never stop putting money into it. And I will tell you one story that you guys know half the story about. And for those of you who are about to read the book, you're going to read the first half of that story, which is that I went almost to bankrupt and I had $1,000 left in my bank account right before I started Gym Launch. What you guys don't know is that I had just under $300,000 saved up. That was in an index. But to me, and you can tell by the way that that story was wrote, that money does not exist. Once it is gone, it is gone. You never see it again. You never touch it. Don't look at it. And if you need to make money, you find a way to make money. You sell something. You work an extra shift. You take up Uber on the weekends, whatever. The point is you don't touch it. Because if you can learn that character trait, you can learn not to put your hand in the cookie jar. You see the money that Marcos can have if he just puts $10,000 away or $25,000 away. Marcos, I see something really crazy. Let's say you save 25 grand this year. And let's say, because you're like, Alex, I'm all in on becoming independently wealthy. Let's say you save 2,500 bucks a month, all right? Because you hustle your ass off selling. Here's what's fucking crazy. That money, that 74 million is being made. It's just the question is whether you're going to be the one who makes it or the bank. That money's being made either way. Think about that. Money is being made all day, every day, all the time. The dollars will always work at the same degree for whoever their master is. The question is whether you're the master of the dollar or the person you're paying. And if yes, you're curious about like what the tactics around this are, all you do is you download Robinhood, which is the app, which is free, you connect your bank account, and you can, you can deposit straight into an index off there. It's very straightforward. You don't need an advisor. They're just going to charge fees, which are actually going to kill your returns. So don't worry about it. S&P 500. Again, this is not investment advice. Do whatever you want with your money. In fact, I might not know anything. So I definitely, I would say, don't listen to my advice. All right. This makes sense for everybody. I'm going to go through the steps one through five again from the top. One, save one to $5,000 because that is the guaranteed fund of something that's going to happen to you. You just don't know when. Number two, you pay off your debts in order of smallest to biggest, not in terms of the number, how much money, how much, what percentage it's earning at. You pay in terms of how little you have to pay it so you can eliminate it and just start crossing out line items, all right? Step two. Step three, you save up three to six months of living expenses. It's up to you, depends on your risk tolerance. Marco can probably save three. You don't have kids or a wife. If you've got kids and a wife, you might wanna save up more. It's up to you. Step four, you look at what you're living with. So if you have a lease on a car, trade it in. Get a $5,000 car and live on that, period. If you can downgrade where you live and what neighborhood you live in, do it. Because I can tell you, we just saw how 35% of your check is going to make someone else $74 million by the end of your life. And it's just up to you whether you want to make it or you want someone else to make it. Step four, actually that was step four. Uh, if, you, if you insist on living, continued step four, step four B. If you insist on living in the same place as you live now, then refinance for a 15 year fix. That way you're going to get the vast majority of the money that you're paying is going to go towards the equity of the house and not to interest fees. And if you do that, you'll be like, whoa, the amount I have to pay every month is so much more. It's almost like you're actually trying to buy it. Fifth, invest 15% of your pre-tax income. Pre-tax, so you have to do some math here. So if you make $50,000 a year, you multiply that by 0.15, just $7,500, and that's what you save. That's minimum. You can do more than that, do more than that. Get aggressive with it, right? And 
If you want to be a superstar, let's say you do that 15 year fixed and you invest 15%, you plow the rest of the excess cash that you have into that equity so you can pay it off early. You're going to make sure that you have no prepayment penalties. So maybe you pay your 15 year fixed off in 10. And then in 10 years, here's what's crazy you have no car fee, you have no house fee, you've learned to live on far less than you make. And now everything beyond the food you eat goes into building your wealth. Everything. And you'll be, you will be frightened to see how fast it grows. And I will share one more fun fact for you guys today. Right now, Layla and I, for this year, made more money on our money than we did from our companies. And I'm being transparent about this because I want to show you that it's possible. You also, if you read the book, see that I had $1,000 in my bank account saved up. And when I started my first gym, I had $4,000 total. You can do this. It just takes discipline. It just takes making choices where you look, Marcos, at that pair of Jordans. And instead of seeing a pair of Jordans, you see $22,000. That's what you have to see. When you see go getting beers with the boys on the weekend for 20 bucks, right? Of course, you wouldn't do that because you're 19 and that's below the legal drinking limit. So the non-alcoholic beer that you get because you're a crazy person. Why would you drink a non-alcoholic beer, you weirdo? Anyways, so you go get your non-alcoholic O'Doul's, right, for 20 bucks. And instead, you see that that's $6,000. $6,000 case beat, very expensive. So just about everyone here has been drinking Top Shelf their whole life. They just don't know it. Okay. Can I add one thing, Alex? That's from... Yes, I was, I was about to wrap up and open it up. So we're good. Okay, cool. Um, something that, um, you know, because Alex and I, obviously, you guys are probably like, well, you guys own the companies, you know, you have lots of money, like, are these things... There's a few things I wanted to point out, which is one, when we first learned about money and money as attention was when we were literally like we had, it was when we first started gym launch, we went almost bankrupt, like in credit card debt, like all that stuff. That's when we got a coach who taught us a lot about money. And one of the biggest things that he talked about was the attention of money, the attention of debt. And so with the first paycheck I got from when Alex just paid me like an employee, when I had made all the sales in the gym in Hawaii, I paid off all my debt with that. And so the reason for that was like, I only had a very small amount left. It was just like the attention that was going towards that debt, right? The second thing with that is the same is true with things that you accumulate. And this is something that we gotten the opportunity to learn as of more recently. Like we had one car, we had a small apartment, we had all these things when we first started the companies. And then over time, you think, hey, well, there's such a large discrepancy in between how I live and then what I have that maybe I can fill it a little bit. And then what happens is that you have attention on those things because if you get a car that's more expensive, maybe you can afford it, but it's the attention it takes because that like for an example, a Toyota you take into the shop takes a week to fix. We have a car that's in the shop right now. It's been eight weeks, hasn't been fixed, right? Things like that, that become complex, even though it doesn't need to be. And so it's not even just the things that you're buying with money. It's the attention you get back when you start saving the money. So for example, I used to tell people when they would come into the gym, and they'd be like, I'm in debt and I'm overweight and this and that. I'd be like, well, you have your nails done, your hair done, your eyelashes. Like, why don't you just get those things done? We're like, they're like, well, I don't feel good about myself because of those things. Right. I do those things to feel better about myself. I'm like, but the reason you feel bad about yourself is because you're in debt and you're fat. So what the hell? And so I think that a lot of the times those things that are like vices, for example, cover like a short-term pain, fear, anxiety, insecurity we have, but it's actually just piling into the long-term one. And so it's like in the short term, it might feel worse to save that money, but in the long term, you'll have way more attention and way less anxiety if you do. So I just want to share that. I think it's even if you have the money to get stuff, stuff adds complexity, which adds more anxiety. And so it's like, we all want more money so we can have more stuff, but then you just feel worse anyways. So it's just, it's just ironic. Was this guys, was this valuable for you guys? This was different than leadership and management stuff and how to run meetings, which are all very important as well. But my goal is if I can decrease the stress of everyone on this call by helping everyone make good financial decisions, then, you know, eventually we can operate as a company of people who are not stressed. Wouldn't that be nice? Because we realize that no matter what, we're secure and we know exactly what our expenses are. We know exactly how much we earn and we know that we make far more than we spend. And we also understand that we are 100% in control of our finances. And so my, my plea to you is that if you've ever felt like someone else is in control or you feel like you've been dealt the shit out of the stick, right? Or you drew, drew the short straw that no one fucking cares. And it's still up to you. Like no one's going to come to save. You. No one's going to come to save. You. But the good news is that 
what you need to do in order to become the 1%. And in case you're curious, one to $5 million in assets is the 1%. That's it. And we just showed Marcos here how to do that with $25,000. And so everyone here, if you're like, man, but I've got, I've got, but I've got, but I'm different. You're not. Just stop. You're not. You're not. You're not. My metabolism's different. Really, you've solved obesity. We can just cure Africa from starvation because your metabolism is special. You figured out a way to not eat food and still gain weight. We have to put you in a lab so we can crack malnutrition. We can just figure out the genes that you have that somehow cause you to not lose weight when you stop eating, right? Somehow you've cracked arithmetic and somehow figured out a way to spend, even to somehow lose money and go into more debt despite spending less than you earned, all right? Like you're not special. The math is the math, right? And so I just like, I wanted to do this call because it's important to me that everyone here on this call can use Gym Launch to become your financial vehicle for wealth and everyone can do that. Minimum wage makes a million dollars over their lifespan. And I showed you the contribution of the $500 a month person, it's $240,000, and it created $3 million. So the question is, do you wanna look like you live like a king or actually live like a king? And I think that living like a king comes from the peace of mind that you get. And for me, that is how money serves me. So I guess you have to figure out how money serves you or whether money's serving you at all. But that $74 million that Marcos has the potential to make over his lifespan, that money is being made. The question is whether or not you want it to be you who makes it. All right. My sermon is over. You got five minutes left. I'm going to hold you. Um, otherwise, thank you guys for your attention. And um, if you guys do get a chance, uh, grab a copy of the, uh, our, sponsored, our sponsored book, $100 million offers. You can find it on Amazon in the link. And if you feel uh, so compelled to leave a, uh, leave a review, uh, that's good, then please do so. If you hate the book, then please don't leave a review. Um, <laughs> Anyway, lots of love, guys. Uh, appreciate you all. Thank you so much for, for being on this journey with us. I hope that we can all use um, the well-being that we help gym owners uh, succeed with, and we can also use the income that you guys have to set yourselves free as well, because you can do it. Be easy. Catch you soon. Bye.